Welcome back to another edition of Components Breakdown. Today we're going to look at one of my favorite games ever to be released, and that is Stronghold. Stronghold was originally made available at Essen 2010, but in extremely limited quantities. It's now available for pre-order and should be released stateside in late September or October 2010. Stronghold tells the story of a siege um, in which players take opposite sides. One has to defend the stronghold while the other tries to break into the castle as soon as possible. As time passes, the defender actually acquires more victory points the longer that he can hold out. It's actually a futile effort though because the attacker will always break through and then you tally up your victory points and see who wins. It's an excellent thematic game, one of my favorite games, but it's also a very complex game and it takes a little while to understand the rules and someone is going to want to devote two hours to play the game. So with that, let's open up the box and see all the components that come inside. So now we have everything laid out on the table and as you can see there's quite a few components in the game which can be quite daunting to first time players. It's actually a very easy game to learn and understand and that is attributed really to the new rule set that came out on the Geek. The game takes probably about 30 minutes to 2 hours and it really depends upon the ability of the defender to hold out for as long as they can. The point system in the game is very unique. It's driven by the glory board itself, which is right here. As when the game originally sets up, you place 10 of these glory tokens, which are two-sided. You have dark side and light side on the dark side, or the attacking side. Every turn, one of these comes over. At the end of every one of these turns, um, the person with the most glory points at the end wins. So, as you can see, the longer that a defender holds out, and doesn't allow the attacker to breach the castle walls, the more victory points and more glory points that they acquire. Now with all these components in here, it could take quite some time to go through them all. So I think the easiest way to do it is to actually look at the game board itself, which is actually the most interesting part of the game, and tie in all the components into the game board to show you the basic flow and mechanics. Now I'm not going to go everything because the game is extremely complex. Um, so with that, let's look at the game board itself. As you notice on here, it's broken into two different regions. There is a foreground and a background. The foreground is for the defender and the background is for the attacker. Each of these two regions are broken into several different subset regions. So we'll start on the attacking side first and show you how they work. There are two spots called the foregrounds and that's where the new attacking um, cubes are brought into play. Now there's, since I said this is a fantasy game, there's three different types of attackers in this game. There's orcs, goblins, and trolls with values of 1, 2, and 3. And they are represented by these very small cubes. When I say small, these are very tiny cubes in here. Um, on the areas, they have numbers representing how many total attackers can be in that spot at a time. Once you move up from those areas, there's a couple different regions, or a couple different um, new elements that are added to the game. There's, this, there's a rectangular spot with rounded corners where the cards will fit. In these areas are the machines that a player will build. And those could be catapults or trebuchets or, or whatnot. On the corners are these little circular dots. These are for training tokens. Now there's a phase in the game when you can train your, your units. And right above that is a small area that's blank. And this is for cover that can be used. And all these are represented by some very nice cardboard chits. Um, all of them are double-sided as well. Now, when new characters are introduced, they move along paths, and as you notice, there are some skulls on here which can funnel troops into specific locations that are better defended by the defending army. These are represented by traps that the offensive player, or the defending player, can lay out for uh, the attackers. Now, they come in two different varieties. There is a white one, and there's a red one, which is right there. The only two things that you can use traps on are orcs and trolls. Or, I'm sorry, goblins and trolls. Orcs will go around, so they're not affected by the traps. As the game works, you're moving attackers down along these different paths into the ramparts. And eventually you go up onto the castle walls themselves. Now all the battles take place over a point system. Walls are worth a specific number of points. Soldiers and marksmen are worth a specific number of points. And your attacking units, which are your goblins, trolls, and orcs, are worth 
a specific number of points with the higher point system winning. And when that happens, you remove wall points. Well, what are wall points? Each of these areas on the wall on the um, on the castle are represented by little gray tokens, which represent walls. Also, in these areas, you have small white circles on some of them, which can be placed cauldrons. Now, cauldrons come in three different varieties as well. There's red cauldrons. There's um, green cauldrons and white cauldrons, simply stating that they will burn that type of troop and they get simply placed in that location. Behind them is a round circle which is used for heroes, which are represented by these larger tokens. Now there's a starting location for all of these and if you notice when you pull these back there's white, white, and green. But these can move, um, can be moved interchangeably as the game as the game ebbs and flows, if people are attacking one side of your castle, you can move them to defend that specific part of the castle. There's also towers in specific areas in which you can put marksmen, which are your white tokens here, into them. That gives you the ability to attack in different areas um, of the fields out there. Also, there can be placed other defending type of, of tokens in here. For instance, there's a pole which will simply drag I'm sorry, that's not the pole. Um, there is a pole that simply drags people off the castle wall, and those can be placed over there instead. As I said, there's a lot of components and a lot of stuff going on. So how does the game actually work, and how does the game flow? Well, there are cards in here that represent six, six different phases for the attacker. As you notice, there is only one of the phases 1 to 6. Those are the same for every single game, but where there's some variety in the game are the phases 2 through 5. Now I've laid out all the cards, but you're only going to be using one of these cards. There are stars up in the upper right hand corner which represent the cards that they suggest you should try on your first game through. But these are completely interchangeable, so if you want to attack the castle in a certain way or try a new kind of strategy, you're free to do that before you start the game. Now, how the phases work are there, there are small little num or symbols in here which represent goblins, orcs, and trolls. At the beginning of phase one, the player that's attacking the castle will get to draw 14 different cubes out of the bag. So they simply take the bag and they draw that many cubes. And they also get an X number of resources. Resources are represented by these brown tokens in here. Now, what these do is they allow the, the resources allow you to build specific um, equipment and specific siege engines that you can use. The way the game works though, which is really cool, is a really fine balancing act that's used in the game. For instance, on phase two, in order to build a cover, you have to sacrifice either one green or two white. So out of those 14 you drew, you don't actually bring them onto the board, you can sacrifice them and use that many resources to build this cover. For every resource that you use, for instance, trolls can build faster than, than orcs and orcs can build faster than goblins. So for every unit you sacrifice, you have to give the defending player an hourglass. The hourglass are represented by these tokens. Now they're two different colors and the only reason for that is if you're playing a four player game in which there's two defending players, you can figure out which player has which hourglass tokens. But let's go back to this mechanic because this is a really cool mechanic. So if you use just one goblin and four resources, that player would get one hourglass token. But if you didn't have the orc to use and you only had two goblins, you would give that player two hourglass tokens. Well, how are the hourglass tokens used? The more stuff that the, the attacking player builds and brings onto the table, the more resources the defender will have in order to defend his castle. Well, how are the hourglasses used? There are several different sections on the board inside the defending castle that allow you to build specific things. For instance, if you were to place an hourglass on this location, it would require four, but you can build a cannon once you've built the fourth one. These carry over from one phase to the next, so you don't have to build everything in one phase. You can start building towards other things until you have the accrued number of hourglasses to bring that in. Now, there are several different phases, as I mentioned. The first phase is simply gathering the resources. The second phase is building your siege engines. 
The third phase is building whatever kinds of equipment you want to build as, as an attacker. And again, it works in the same way. One orc or two goblins plus one resource to bring this equipment in, which is the removal of a trap. The next one is your training. And there are several different training as well. And to bring these in, as you notice, they also cost a specific number of your attackers. The fifth phase is rituals, which is the magic in the game. Now the attackers can cast specific magic spells to allow them to breach walls faster, to throw uh, specific rocks, um, time different uh, manipulations and whatnot. And the last thing is the movement or the dispatch of your troops. And this is represented by a minor or a major dispatch. Five means you can move five troops, and seven means you can move seven, and that's the number of those hourglass markers you give to the player. The last thing is you check your camp to see how many people remained at camp. Camps are the foreground locations we saw before. The more troops you have in camp that were not able to be moved, the more hourglass markers you give to the defending player to take actions. Now there's a huge number of actions, as you can see here on the board, and I'll try to get at all of them as I can, there's a huge number of actions that the defender can take every round, um, which gives them a lot of chances to actually move troops around, reinforce troop positions, and introduce new elements to the game that can hinder the, uh, the attacking unit. The other really cool thing I like about the game is the hit-miss system. Now, for the defenders, they use a set of cards to tell you which items you hit. For instance, this hits one of any of those that you want to hit. There are several different cards that hit only specific different creatures. But the cool part comes with the attacking. The attacking player always has the advantage, and they are represented by these hit-miss cards here. And on the cards are hits and misses. And as the game goes on, you're removing more misses and adding more hits into that deck, just allowing the player to actually target on to the castle and be able to hit it, just like in real life. The more misses you have, the more ability you're going to be able to target into that key location that you need to hit. It's a great system, and I really enjoy it. Now, there's a lot more elements, as I said. There's the ability to... Um, take a battering ram and knock down the castle, which can get you in fairly quickly. The battering ram is represented by these tokens here, in which you have to actually build in the battering ram section and house it by different units and then break through three sequential gates. Um, I'm not going to go into all the mechanics. I think that's enough for right now. As you can tell by my voice, I'm really excited about this game. I've always liked this game. The problem with the game that I have is that my wife does not enjoy it. So it gets very little play. Um, I'm going to introduce this to a couple different gamers that are into this style of game, and I think they're really going to enjoy it because it's, it's extremely deep. There's a lot of strategy involved to it. It's a beautiful game to look at. Some people had some quibs about the cubes being used, but it doesn't detract from the game at all because it's a very deep strategy game with a huge amount of theme in it. And I would encourage anybody that enjoys these style games to look into it because it's wonderfully done, and it's one of my favorite games of all time. So that's Stronghold, and thanks again for watching.